Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for staying around, having a fabulous tea break. I could hear lots of excitement in the room. My name is Lisa Given. I'm Associate Dean Research and Development in the Faculty of Health, Arts, and Design at Swinburne University of Technology. Um, and I'm very excited to be chairing this session, partly because instead of talking about administrivia, I actually get to focus on things that are about like the research I do. Um, so I'm really excited that, that Amanda has teed me up um, for this event. We're going to be talking about data, all things data, very exciting. What I do in my own day job is I actually look at how people use technology. So I do work in user experience, how people use technology for decision making, a real focus on things like social media and what fun. I've only been at Swinburne about eight months, so I've still been learning a lot about APO, everything that they do, and I'm really excited that I have my first research report up in the repository. Before I even knew it was in there, I'd had 48 downloads, I couldn't believe it. So do take a look at the APO obs Observatory, it's fantastic. And um, today, though, I'm going to spend most of the time corralling you folks, corralling our speakers. We've got three fantastic speakers today talking to us about our next topic, which is aptly labeled Data, Tools, and Platforms, How Technology May Help or Hinder Public Policy and Decision Making. Our first speaker off the rank is Jane Farmer from the Social Innovation Institute at Swinburne. Jane. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, so this is, this is my talk, um, really about looking at engaging the public, I think, to be honest. Um, but first of all, I just want to give you a bit of an overview of the um, ARC LEAF funded project that Alex Subic alluded to when he gave his introduction. Um, it's really quite a, a coup that we've, um, in our partnership, um, which goes beyond Swinburne, obviously, um, got this, this grant. So it's a two-year multi-institute, multi-database project uh, to obviously enable public policy research to get into new frontiers. It's really a, about a step change, the way of accessing and analysing policy documents and data. We have a range of topics in there. Um, a lot of the, uh, the work will evolve around the, the linking of these um, classic databases. Um, so APO, as you know, we've been talking about the Australian Data Arga Archive, ORIN, which is the Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network, and the Home Modification Clearinghouse. And the way that we're going to get these databases to interact and enable you to have more um, meta-searching, I guess, is to develop standard taxonomies for searching and indexing and standards for the data. Um, we're going to link documents and other types of data between the data sets so that um, we can get into that idea of kind of um, linking of multimedia data and, uh, and reports, grey literature and the data that underlies them. We're going to be able to mine the, the grey literature for the underlying citations which will give much greater access to uh, more grey literature beneath that grey literature. And we're going to be uh, in an innovative way getting into knowledge graphing to enable visualising of relationships between the data sets and um, things that are lying within these data sets. Like, there's a whole bunch of other enabling within this two years. And when I read it again yesterday, I thought, how are we going to do this in two years? But um, there's great people in there. And as I said, it's a great partnership. And I do think that's one of the really cool things about APO, that it is such a strong partnership. And if you're interested in any way in being part of it, let us know and speak to Amanda. Um, so really, uh, my, my position in life really is as a butterfly. On the top left-hand uh, corner there, I'm afraid that these days um, I, I kind of float about and I pick up information where I can, and all of that information comes together to form my worldview and what I think is going to be exciting. So a lot of you have probably got depth, and you're thinking, for God's sake, what is that woman on about? Does she not know that this is already happening? I apologise to you. As I say, I'm a bit of an information surfer. But I guess a few of you probably are as well, because we're all really, really busy, right? And I just pulled together these as some of the things that I read on the train. That's what public transport is for. And, um, yeah. So, I, my, it's, I'm, as Joe Barraquette alluded to earlier, I've spent most of my life taking... Um, 
sort of evidence to citizens, I guess, and saying, look, this is what people are on about. Come on, you know, come on, let's do stuff together. Let's get engaged with this evidence and you are the people that can make change happen. So um, I guess an, a flavour of this into APO is one of the exciting things that I would like us um, to take forward into the future. So um, uh, there was an event here last week on Friday. It was the CRC for Low Carbon Living. There was a lot of researchers in the room and um, I found that talking to researchers in the same discipline as yourself is quite easy and you realise that you're talking the same language. But when you're talking to researchers from different disciplines, that's really quite hard because you think you're telling them about something and they're actually receiving something else. So being able to um, have a conversation with people even from other disciplines as academics is difficult. But then we need to take the conversation to the interested citizens. I say the interested citizens because I showed in one of my slides to Amanda a picture of the Herald Sun and she said, no, no, it's not just Herald Sun readers that need to understand this, it's other people as well. So, um, yeah, so how do we take the evidence to everyone, I guess, is what I'm on about. So really, how might we take APO into a more public sphere if we want to? And, you know, um, it wouldn't it be great if we had Donald Trump saying that? <laughs> Probably completely unimaginable, but you never know. With the help of APO, it could be possible. Um, so how might we do this? By Perhaps by partnering with other platforms and organisations that already are in kind of similar and interested spaces. <laughs> So uh, just a flavour of what some of these might be. There is, there's an online platform called MyVote. I don't know if any of you have come across MyVote. Um, this is just a screen grab from it. You can probably potentially see that what they're talking about here is Australia's political donation system. How would you prefer political parties to fund their campaigns? So basically they put an issue out there. Uh, they tell people who... Uh, subscribe to this, the facts, on different um, sides of the story, I guess, um, and then people vote. So it's uh, a good way of conveying the facts to people who are interested in this platform. Uh, another example is uh, another platform called IRSA, which again some of you might have engaged with. Um, this is an organisation uh, that uh, works with councils or um, civil society organisations and its rationale is to uh, reach more people, hold conversations, gather insights to help people make decisions quickly and effectively. So it's hired by decision makers to give out facts, the community looks at it and gives its opinion and then decision makers can use that information. So really, as I'm saying, the challenge, I think, is to make this meaty information that we have within uh, APO and uh, these other great linked databases that we're going to have uh, more accessible, more widely, by potentially by tapping into people's existing interests and media habits, media use. Um, so, so again, just in an imaginary world, perhaps we could have Malcolm Turnbull telling people to um, think about climate change and weigh up different solutions. I know it's a stretch but you never know so how might this happen uh, so I think some of the things that we've built into our new grant will enable us to do some of this so we might be able to get a lot more into data viz so perhaps we'll be able to um, draw scrape data out of reports and across reports to build data visualizations that are uh, topographical three-dimensional um, um, and potentially uh, interactive. Uh, we might be able to get more into the space of infographics. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw the infographic on the conversation last week about the Adani uh, Carmichael mine and what it means for Queensland. If you clicked on that and went through the infographic, it was pretty amazing. I sent it around to a few of my colleagues and they said, wow, that's, that's amazing. So, you know, in a few minutes of clicking, uh, you were, there was a lot of information conveyed there, which was uh, data, statistics, links to other sites, and so on, and, and um, factual but persuasive. 
So perhaps this is another dimension that we'll be able to leverage with our new grant, but also into the future to interact with the more with a public debate. Uh, so another article I, I grabbed recently when I was looking at The Economist was an article where they had basically done a kind of scraping of, uh, of the web um, to put together a map of gay life in Britain. Again, we might be able to use techniques like this through our new grant to scrape the data that we have and potentially look at other data that might be out there to present new pictures of data. Um, so we can build on the policy data we have and build in other data that's available and uh, you know, present new data or new depictions of data. And then just getting a little bit more kind of crazy, if you like. Um, I'm a recent convert to Instagram. Um, I love Instagram because basically you get a picture and it's kind of easy on the brain. And then there's a tiny little bit of text underneath it. And I think Instagram's pretty cool if you love, if you love indexing. Um, Instagram's a way of making everybody index data because you have to put hashtag blah, 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 and it makes you think about what you're actually writing about. I know, it's a bit crazy. But um, maybe we could have an Instapio. Can I be in charge of picking the pictures? <laughs> And then my final um, sort of throw out to you is maybe we can have VRAPO, VRAP APO, so a VR APO. So maybe we have uh, interactive um, experience with APO. You're walking around the streets in Melbourne and you get reports about urban planning. You get reports about density. You get reports about homelessness in the streets of Melbourne. You get reports about transport. You get links to data coming up as you wander around the city. These are just some crazy, perhaps, or potentially interesting thoughts about how we can bring APO more into the public sphere. So, my conclusion. APO already achieves excellence. Uh, we know it's the fifth most important repository in Australia and 141st in the world. It may have gone up since I got these statistics. Uh, and coupled in our new grant with uh, these other fantastic data sets from ORIN, ADA and others, we will have even more excellence. So one potential next vision is to take APO into spaces, more spaces end users are, are already using and to experiment with new end-user engagement spaces. That is my thought for today. Terrific. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> Excellent. She really is a woman after my own heart talking interdisciplinarity, user engagement, multi-platform. I think that's exactly where the world's going. Um, I've been doing work myself with hospitals, farmers, winemakers, all sorts of different people and coming at the world from technology, education, social, sociology, all of that, mixing it all together and building some wonderful things. So next gen APO is, is right on track. Thumbs up. Uh, our next speaker is Tim Cahill, who is Associate Director Advisory at KPMG. Without further ado. Good afternoon, um, just. Um, so, just a little bit of background on myself. So, I'm currently, as uh, introduced, at KPMG working uh, specifically around building a higher education research practice there. Um, my former life has been consulting with universities around research performance, um, research planning, strategy, etc. And uh, quite some years ago now, um, I was director of the ERA at the Australian Research Council. Um, see if I'm getting a friendly reception for that one or not. Um, and prior to that, uh, a, a failed uh, career as a young academic. Um, so today, I think I'll just talk very briefly um, about the metrics side of universities um, and some of the key lessons that I've observed over the years of working in different roles um, where I guess we're implementing different metric regimes on top of academic work and some of the consequences that we're now starting to see um, for better or for worse around that. Um, and I should say, for the first time in about the best part of 20 years, I've actually written 
down what I plan to say rather than winging it with a slide set. So um, we'll see how that goes. Um, scientific revolutions are inaugurated by a growing sense that an existing paradigm has ceased to function adequately in the exploration of an aspect of nature to which the paradigm itself had previously led the way. So said Kuhn in 1962. In the intervening years, there have been massive changes to the world of academic work, not least of which it's estimated that academic literature grows at an annual rate of around 8 to 10%, confirmed by a couple of studies uh, extending back to 2000. That means that in the period between when Kuhn was making that statement and today, scientific literature will have doubled no less than six times. To put this in some perspective, global population growth is estimated at around 1.62% on average across that same period. So there's this massive explosion. I've already deviated from what I planned to read out. Um, there's this massive explosion in academic literature, um, which is certainly not explained uh, by growing population. The growth of publishing has been accompanied by an explosion in the number of journals and supported by ever increasing public spending on research. It's no surprise then that we have increasingly come to rely on metrics to account for all of this additional activity. To assist with resource allocation, to provide tools for accountability, we've designed ever more complex systems of measurement. But the evidence shows that at least the current suite of metrics that we're using is now probably shaping the progress of science itself and challenging Kuhn's notion of scientific progress. In Australia, we've got two relatively recent and great examples of how metrics can at least shape academic behaviours. The first is the introduction of the publication quantum into the research block grants in university funding in the 1990s. As Linda Butler has demonstrated, between 1988 and 1997, Australia's share of publications in the Science Citation Index increased 25%. The relative citation impact of those journals where Australian academics were publishing saw an equally impressive, isn't the right word, uh, but impressive decline in the same period. The second example is that, is that of the ERA ranked journal list, and this is where I duck and hide um, as the person formerly responsible for it. When this was introduced, it almost overnight changed the game of academic publishing in this country. With academics scrambling to get their work published in A-star and A-ranked journals exclusively, much to the detriment of regional and applied journals. Both examples show how reactive academics are to metrics and incentive mechanisms. But what we're now seeing is an emerging empirical body of evidence that demonstrates how the focus of research assessment on measures of peer review or mechanisms of peer review and measures of citation are actually starting to limit the types and range of works that academics will undertake. It's been referred to as the evaluation gap. And that's the gap between the narrow focus on what is measured on the one hand and the broader and multiple of universities on the other hand. Delivering broader social benefits, applying knowledge to solve pressing issues and contributing to policy development and community engagement are oftentimes ignored as researchers focus their attention on performing against explicit evaluation criteria. A couple of examples of what I'm talking about. The first is a recent study titled Accounting for Impact, how the impact factor is shaping research and what this means for knowledge production. It basically examines how the journal impact factor influenced the knowledge production practices of three research groups in two university medical centres in the Netherlands. It found that the journal impact factor was an important consideration, particularly for the translational and applied research groups in their knowledge production practices as an indicator of the quality and innovation of their work to peers. Importantly, have found that these scientists, again remembering that they're in the translational and applied end of medical research, while they did not always agree with the use of the journal impact factor, felt that they must accommodate demands to demonstrate the impact of their published work to peers in order to progress their careers. 
This meant often prioritising citation impact over the translational or research, uh, over translation of research into clinical settings. In other words, the pressure to publish in high impact journals was having adverse consequences on the core uh, mission that they were pursuing, which was the translation of their research into clinical settings. A second study titled Racing for What? Question mark. Anticipation and acceleration in the work and career practices of academic life science postdocs. This includes a series of interviews with postdoctoral scientists in Austria trying to understand the changing demands uh, of their work and career practices over time. This study finds that the scientists perceived the highly competitive nature of their work and career establishment to place a strong focus on individual achievement and continually accelerating working pace. It also found that these perceptions impact research practices and production with quantity and speed of production by the individual becoming valued over quality in a fast paced and individualised environment. Now in both of these examples, Academics are not just responding to incentives, but the incentives themselves are clearly starting to shape up what work, work gets done and what work gets ignored. In other words, we're now observing how metrics can start to influence not just the behaviour of academics, but the progress of science itself. As I've said, I speak from the perspective of being a former director of the ERA and as the guy who ran the Academy of Technological Sciences and Engineering uh, pilot of industry engagement, which has gone on to influence the ARC's current engagement evaluation. But I can categorically say that the longer we continue to abuse metrics, the more damage we'll do to science itself. Most recently, for example, I've seen that the ERA list even though it was last used by the ARC in 2010 and last updated by public, via public consultation around 2009, 2010, is still used in most universities today, um, either officially or unofficially. <coughs> I also recently saw one faculty's proposed metrics for how they were going to measure research, which included the uh, directive that they would effectively publish in journals that were highly ranked against Google Scholar's H index. Now, as a practising bibliometrician, I understand, A, the limitations of Google data for bibliometric analysis, i.e. you can't use it because you can't normalise it for year and you can't normalise it for discipline. I also understand the pitfalls of journal-level metrics and my community uh, of practitioners and scholars has for years been trying to advise other academics and institutions not to use journal-level metrics for research evaluation. But this isn't to say that we shouldn't be using metrics. I firmly believe that robust and carefully designed metrics will successfully drive our research sector in the directions we want it to go. For example, the research quantum successfully lifted academic production in Australia. ERA successfully focused academics on the quality of venues where they published. These were both good outcomes, even though there were negative uh, unintended consequences. So the question is, what's to be done now? How do we design metrics that can start to foster the positive outcomes and promote the best of what science and research have to offer? I'll leave you with one observation, um, and I'm happy to talk quite freely and loosely in the, in the uh, questions. Um, but the current academic system and the metrics that we use to measure it are all based on mechanisms of individual reward. The importance of peer review, journal articles, the importance of being a lead author, single person ARC grants and fellowships, the idea of the chief, chief investigator in the first place, promotions processes, career development, patents and our entire IP system, the list goes on. But all of these different instances take the individual as the unit of measurement. Even when these are aggregated, aggregated up to country and institution level metrics, the actual unit is the individual academic. For example, the institutional citation metrics used in global university rankings are built on individual paper citations which flow back to individual researchers. Effectively, this has promoted a culture of competition that has likely led to the large degree of wasted effort that we see in our system. One need only look at the current ARC and NHMRC success rates, which are somewhere between 15 and 18%, depending on which program, to understand this. 
remembering as well that the ARC and HMRC Category 1 funding accounts for around 50% of the support that federal government provides to universities for research under the current system. In other words, 50% of that government support is predicated on metrics of individual success and measurement. The question I put to this forum is, is competition the most efficient and effective mechanism to deliver our scientific endeavour? Does it imbue the kind of research culture that we want to have? I'll leave you with the words of uh, Simon Marginson, who uh, some years ago now said the following. Competition is always better at creating private goods than public goods. Advocates of equity in higher education spend too much energy trying to create fair competition, which is impossible. It is the competitive order itself that should be tackled, particularly the way status differentials in higher education feed in the continuous jousting undermine the commons. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Tim. It's funny, I thought I was the only one that ever apologized for metrics because being an information scientist, we created all of those journal impact factors, citation metrics, et cetera, and I often am very sadly ashamed at how they get used or misused. Um, the other piece I wanted to throw in there, and we can maybe explore this in, in Q&A if people are interested, is that I think it's also about the stranglehold of a metrics culture. And as somebody who actually works very actively in qualitative approaches, as we move into thinking about impact and engagement in particular with the ARC's new round, we've got to actually embrace qualitative approaches and not be driven by the simple metrics that politicians and others seem to love. All right, on that note, we've got Mark Sanderson, who's going to be our final speaker for this morning, ECP Director, Information Systems Engineering at RMIT. Cool, thanks very much. Um, so I will completely wing it um, uh, because um, uh, I just wanted to see what else was going to be said here today. She was just going to mention something that Tim was saying. Um, I went to a fascinating talk. Um, so I'm a computer scientist. I'm a sort of a token geek, I think, at, uh, at today's meeting. Um, and I was asked to maybe come along and talk a little bit about where there might be sort of other technological um, uh, advancements um, over time. One of the things that really struck me, actually, just because I'm just going to tell this story, although I hadn't really planned to do it, was um, these, um, these quantitative um, uh, impact-driven, you know, these sort of these measures that we use, uh, you know, counting the number of citations or impact of journals. Um, I went to a fascinating presentation by Microsoft uh, and Bookings.com. Uh, and these guys, so Microsoft runs Bing, uh, the, the search engine that you probably don't use, but actually uh, Bing has actually been slowly taking market share away from Google. And so they were giving a talk at one of the big search engine conferences um, earlier this year about how they were doing it. Um, and a lot of what these guys are doing, uh, men and women, uh, was that they were, uh, they, they run experiments all the time. Um, and they watch how we use all these different websites, Facebook, Google, Bing, bookings.com, everybody is doing it. Um, uh, you know, we know some people at Seek and they're doing it. Uh, they're continually trying out new versions of their system. And they watch, you know, where you click and how long you stay on the site and so on. And it struck me actually when I was listening to them, because what they were saying was they, they, they invent these measures to sort of watch how we behave. And the measures aren't that important to them. What's important to them is that Bing gets more market share against Google, or it makes more money, or Facebook engages you for longer, or it gets more money. But it uses these short-term measures to actually predict whether they're going to do well. And it's a bit like a KPI. Um, the interesting thing is that they very much aware that these KPIs are a nightmare. Um, and they have stories this long about how they tried one KPI and they threw it away, tried another KPI, threw it away. This KPI seemed good for about six months and then they realized it was dragging people off into an area they didn't want to go. Um, and so um, uh, both Microsoft and Google were saying they have a lab of statisticians who just research KPIs. They actually have testing it. I mean, I, I'm a measurement person, so this was like a, a, you know, a dream to hear about this. These guys actually have a lab to test out whether KPIs work. So they've recorded uh, massive improvements to their search engine, and then when someone comes up with a new way of measuring uh, user behavior, they run it against recordings of user behavior to see whether this new measure would have done a better job at predicting things. And it's not the same, but it was very interesting to see these companies using the equivalent of KPIs, but very willingly understanding that these things are a nightmare to set up. 
and just changing them around, changing them, changing them, changing them until they got what they liked. And then, you know, nine months down the line, if it's not working for them, flipping it and changing it to a different one. So I think KPIs are definitely possible, and using, you know, sim simplistic quantitative measures can get you there, but it takes a lot of work. At least the lessons from these guys was it took a lot of work to actually really nail how to actually uh, design a KPI that properly predicts some long-term benefit that, that, that you want. Um, in terms of sort of, um, I, I love um, uh, Robin's presentation about um, all these sort of interesting new ways that we could present information um, to users uh, and, and to get people to engage. And you probably don't need me to tell you about, you know, my teenage kids and how they don't do anything like, um, uh, like, like I did or like my parents did. Uh, I'm sure you have those stories all to yourself. Um, if there's anything to sort of talk about sort of the, 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 the changes um, that, that are certainly going on, you know, without a doubt, then de delivery of information is all through social media. And so if we're thinking of ways of making the information uh, that we have here at the APO available, it's going to have to be uh, in, in ways that, that, get, that get to people. You know, uh, my kids wouldn't even recognize those, those newspaper uh, you know, uh, screenshots, so they, they, just, they, they just don't do that. I mean, uh, then let me tell you one quick story. Uh, the, the, uh, the Freeview box on, on our TV broke uh, on, on October 31st. Uh, I've yet to hear a complaint from anyone in my family. We, we've stopped receiving live television in our house, and no one cares. Um, I, actually, by the way, that's me, that's my wife, and that's my two teenage kids. They don't care, because they access it through some other means. Um, so, um, so, you know, so how else is the world potentially going to be changing? Well, one thing you've probably noticed, uh, you know, we were mentioning coming in on the train, so many of us are accessing information uh, through these devices. And I think it's interesting to ask ourselves what's going on with these devices. Uh, and, and certainly uh, when you talk to the people who are building apps for, say, something like this, as opposed to this laptop that's in front of me or your desktop machine at, at your work or at your house, um, is that the means of accessing information is very different on these things. So um, I, I'm a search engine person. You, there are some very nice papers from, from the search engine companies showing that the way that people interact with search on this as opposed to search on this is very different. Um, so people, for example, can't be bothered clicking on the documents. If you can get the answer in that little search result page after the query, they're very happy. Whereas here, they'll go and click on documents. So, so sort of user behavior is actually different. Uh, and one of the things you're probably noticing, particularly with Google, but all of the search engines are doing this, is they're not just trying, you know, the, the classic kind of search engine shape that we've all known and loved, uh, which is, you know, the, those 10 blue links. Um, that's, I think, be increasingly being realized as being a kind of a, 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 a temporary position. Uh, it's a technical convenience just to show the user a list of, of, of links. And what you're probably noticing these days is when you search on Google, uh, but on the other search engines as well, if you type in uh, a question like, I don't know, you say, what's the cost of the East-West link? Google will pull something out of ABC News and give you an estimate, and it'll show you like a paragraph. They're putting a lot of effort into making that work. It, it turns out that it's very complicated to do. Uh, and they're spending a lot of money to do it, but they're doing it because they're finding people like it and particularly like it on these things. Um, and so um, there's, there's a sort of a move away from showing you lists of things to trying to just get you the answer. Um, and that, the, 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 there's a big push both in the research community and in the, in the commercial search communities to try and just get you the answers. Um, and that's going to be very interesting. You know, wh where that's going to lead us uh, is, is um, I, I, I don't quite know. I, in fact, I think it's going to get more extreme. Um, you know, I don't know if you've noticed the people with the little sort of wireless Apple Buds headphones. Um, those things, you know, you tap a button on them and you can speak to Siri. And then if Siri can give you an answer, they just speak it straight back into your ear. Um, so, you know, this isn't necessarily the end game either. Um, you know, you see some interesting reviews from the people who've got the Apple Watch 3, which has got cellular uh, connect connectivity on it now, and people saying, gosh, it's really nice just to sort of, uh, uh, you know, ask, ask Siri to do certain things for me. The watch works it out, speaks it back into my buds. Um, so I think sort of intense distillation of information, you know, uh, and, and, and summarization of it is potentially one area where we're sort of going to go. Now, what that means about trust, what that means about lots of other things, of course, is, an, is another matter. 
Uh, but yeah, let, why don't I finish there? Um, and just a, a few things that I've noticed. Um, uh, so the current sort of process that we have of search engines returning those sort of standard lists of pages that you then click on is just a journey on, on our way to somewhere else. Exactly where that other place is, I don't think we're entirely sure, but certainly there's a lot of research going into this idea of just pulling answers out of, uh, out of reports, out of documents, and then presenting those directly to people. Um, um, so yes, why don't I leave it there and um, I'll finish there, thank you. Great. Thank, thanks very much, Mark. Um, this really is my dream team panel. It's very exciting. Um, and, you know, and my inner librarian's very excited right now. Um, but I, for me, it's about closing the loop as well. Like, you know, as I listen to this talk and I think about how people are actually engaging, what they're doing with tech in the world, I'm doing a lot of work right now with some nonprofit community organizations where they're still struggling to get their website up and running. Um, they're thinking web apps might be the next big thing, but they don't know how to design them well. Uh, and a lot of people will create a horrible tool for you for 3,000 bucks, but no one may use it. So I think that's a space, again, where all of us can be coming together on inner disk teams with tech skills we need. Um, and I can imagine that, that APO can be at the heart of that, which is exciting to me. So we're going to do roving mic time. We've got about 15-ish minutes before lunch. Yes, starting right here. My name is Richard Vines from the Department of Economic development, jobs, transport and resources. I work in the agribio division in agriculture. I've, so I'm not quite sure how to ask the question, there is a question here. Um, <laughs> but I, yeah, the, the talk about um, rewards for academics and all of the stilting of the, system, the knowledge systems towards publications is clearly a problem that's been around for a while. What I hear in these presentations so often, though, is not really any solution to actually um, deliver authoritative evidence in forms that's accessible or shaded forms of accessibility to citizens or to stakeholders and all of the in-between. And I work in a department that is just like, like every other department, and the US is no better than Australia. In it. Um, everybody's suffering from it, but it is simply appalling the gap between what we're talking about here in terms of delivering authoritative evidence that's, uh, that's authorised by social systems to allow for shades of open release and reuse. And I uh, can give you one example. I work with a very knowledgeable uh, modeler um, who's at the heart of why Victoria has got a moratorium on coal seam gas uh, exploration. Groundwater modelling is also at the heart of environmental water flows down the Murray-Darling. Now, he works, and his team, and the team, um, and has he's built, I think, 38 versions of a catchment an, an analysis tool that's reliant on five different software integration applications that has data sets that are all over the place. Um, and they, he receives some data from data.thick, he finds that it's inadequate, he has to improve it, and then he can't give it back to them. Because So the next person who really actually wants to deal with good quality data can't deal with it. Now the, the, the question is, I, you know, I, I just really struggle because I don't know how to deal with this problem. Um, and I'm not certain that I'm actually hearing any easy answer to uh, what I'm... Because APO, we've worked with APO and we really respect it, but it, again, it's an island outside institutions. The real problem is the, in, the, the transformation of, in, uh, of institutions themselves, and there, there's a whole lot of problems with big vendors, uh, applications and trim... applications of trim that, you know, can't deal with any of this stuff. So where's the, the question is, where is the innovation for the transformation of the guts of the system going to come from? So my take on this is, I, mean, I absolutely agree with what you're identifying um, as, a, as a missing bit of the system. Um, what policy has done over quite a few years now if you think about it as a supply and demand equation, 
There's been a lot of supply side policy pushing universities to do more with industry, pushing universities to you know, do X, Y and Z differently. What there hasn't been a lot of uh, political leadership on is the demand side. Um, so everybody's seen the OECD figure around our collaboration with industry. Forget that for a second. There's a really great OECD figure which is researchers employed by sector, um, employment sector. And Australia is the fourth lowest across the OECD for researchers working outside of academia. We're just above Portugal, Slovakia, Chile, and I can't remember the fourth. But not, not the R&D intensive countries by any stretch. Korea is up the other end, and that's got probably an imbalance of researchers working in the private sector, in business enterprise. So the other side of that is that the system of reward for business to work with uh, universities doesn't exist. The R&D tax system is the only game in town in Australia to incentivise private sector to work with uh, universities. Sadly, that uh, is much more beneficial to the big end of town that we're probably doing R&D anyway, as opposed to creating new links between the SMEs that our private sector is largely characterised by. I think 75, uh, sorry, 96% or so of our uh, registered trading businesses are SMEs of less than 20 employees. So, you know, how are they ever going to engage with a university? Not under the current model and not without demand side policy settings changing as well as university supply side policy changes said. Jane? Yeah, I, was, I, I guess I took a couple of things from what you were saying. One was about, you know, how do we get this information over to the public in kind of accessible ways? And one was about all these crunchy data sets and how do we get them to kind of, how can we use them to kind of get some decent metadata? Is that is that kind of a, yeah. And so, uh, uh, generally, on the second point, I think the grant that we've just got is kind of getting in that direction. And I think it would be absolutely brilliant to talk to some end users that might want to ask it specific questions. Um, so I think one of the issues is really about engaging with users of the data who now want to do more, or the, or the tools that APO can have who now want to do more complicated things than APO has been providing up to now. So I think getting into conversation with you would be good, yeah. Um, I think in terms, of, in terms of getting decent data in reasonable bite-sized chunks to the public, I think I probably didn't say it very well, but I think that's the frontier that I'm really interested in. How do we get that stuff to the public in ways they want to absorb it? And ways they're interested to engage with, and I, I think that is something that we, you know, need to do next. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> I've got less data to the back at what I'm saying, but yeah. Um, if I can add to that, I think the other missing link in all of this is knowledge translation work. And coming from Canada, we had government-funded schemes that researchers could apply for purely for knowledge translation. So after the grant and research work was done, you could get funding to go out and actually help an organization to apply what it was you learned. Because from my perspective, even just bringing the data to the people is a missing, you know, that's a good first step, but it will not necessarily help to bring about change and adoption of innovation. Other questions, we've got multiple roving microphones in the room. Comments, questions? At the back, thank you. Hi, I'm Simon Burrows. I'm a um, 18th century historian and digital humanist. So I just <laughs> want to, one thing that seems to lie behind a lot of these papers um, or be a bit of an elephant in the room is the whole question of political community and whether we should put into question in ways that uh, are much more immediate now, the question of whether we can talk about a civic or public and public engagement. Um, the theori theorists of the development of the nation state as our fundamental unit of political organization um, argue that the coming of particularly newspapers as news media created a common, uh, a common news media, a common conversation in communities that then imagine themselves as, as nations. Um, and then in the broadcasting age, radio and common television news 
providers uh, kept those communities together. It does seem to me there's a question uh, with new technologies, with people no longer tuning into televisions, but choosing to stream their programs from wherever, uh, with a lack of engagement with common news media, whether they're tabloids, which give more information certainly than, than a tweet, um, whether the common political organisation we have may even be under threat. And in an island continent nation like Australia, it may be less problematic than a European country with, with uh, regionalism and so forth. But even now, has to, do we need a separate North Queensland from a South Queensland, I saw after the election? So I wonder whether they're formulating a question around this is, is, is difficult. But I guess I'd want, particularly on this panel, I'd like to ask the uh, questioners whether they think actually that our um, basic political organisational structures at state or national level are to some extent challenged by, um, in ways that if we can get uh, policy and analysis and keep that quality discourse alive, how, how do we do that? to maintain the sort of unity between citizens and, and move away from the dangers of fragmentation of communities um, that seem to be implied by Brexit or um, the rise of Trump and so forth, as well as uh, secessionist movements in many parts of the Western world. Big well, question. I can, I can have a little go and then I can pa pass it to you. Um, look, I, I really think this is where universities have to step up. Right. I mean, I think it is, it is our role as, um, we, we have like potentially a unique role in society nowadays to be able to do this um, still, and, and we should. And I think that's why, you know, here we are in the APO community. I think that's something we all want to do. And um, we're a mixed community of academics and policy and so on. But we have that, that mission, that, that vision um, and I think, so I think in, within a community like this, we can do this. Um, I mean, just a little bit listening to Tim talking about metrics and blah, 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 I kind of thought, you know, I've been an academic for nearly 30 years. I have not been metrics driven in any of that time. I've basically thought, I'm gonna do what I think is good. I'm gonna do what I think is interesting. I'm gonna do what I think is, you know, brings people along and so, yeah, I think I think there's there are academics who aren't so metric driven. I think it depends on different fields and so on. Um, so I think you know I, I'm not totally convinced. I do think metrics distort things, but I think as as people in this space, we have to be driven by our own sense of good, our own sense of society, and it's our responsibility to to do this, especially academics. I think it's the last bastion of who are allowed to do this, if you like. Um, uh, so the, the, the thing I was going to mention uh, in response to what you were saying was, I, I think undoubtedly there, is, there was a very nice article in a, I think a political science journal uh, recently that was um, studying the spread of broadband in America. So, and it wasn't picking on America because that's, it was just, it just so happened that in America, broadband came out in each of the 50 states at a different time. And they were able to study whether people became more partisan uh, when, when broadband was switched on in each of those states. And most of the paper, it's a great paper, it spent most of its time el eliminating all of these confounding factors. And in the end, they decided that actually the, the, the availability of broadband back in the 90s was starting to make people more politically partisan, sort of spread it splitting off. So there, there is definitely um, uh, a force there uh, that, that, that people uh, do seem to like to go and find things that sort of agree with what they, they, uh, they want. And, and everyone talks about the filter bubble in, in Facebook. It was actually a very good article in Science where Facebook studied whether the filter bubble, their algorithm, uh, was actually causing people to go, you know, to become sort of isolated. And they said a little bit, but mostly it's people clicking on things that they agree with. Um, so there's, there's definitely those kinds of uh, pressures in a society that are emerging that weren't there before for, I think, the reasons that you've just been describing. The, the other thing, I, I used to work in a library school uh, back in the UK, 
And I guess the other thing I would say is that the other thing that's gone away is, is, um, is, is librarians, you know, and librarians uh, did a lot of things. We, have, we haven't gone away. Uh, well, but, you know, uh, but, 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 the, but the, nature of the, the nature of their job has certainly changed. And one of the things that I think we sometimes forget is how important they were, particularly in acquisitions. So, you know, so, so the, the library wasn't just full of everything. It was full of good quality stuff. You know, the people taking the library course at Sheffield University had a whole module on, on, on acquisitions policy and, and, and so making sure the library had, you know, not, not a particular political bias, just good stuff. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the things that, that's interesting is to ask ourselves how we then make sure that people uh, go after good stuff. Um, you know, my personal view is, is, you know, particularly at schools, things like information literacy uh, is, is something that we need to be thinking more about getting, um, getting kids to think about, about high quality sources. Um, you know, it, it, often people go to places because they're convenient, and if you show them that there's an easy way of getting good quality stuff, they often go there because they want to do the right thing. Uh, but they often don't know where, how to get the right thing uh, to, to, to be done. Um, but, um, and so yeah, I, 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 I do broadly agree with your view though. Uh, it, the, 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 there are definitely new forces in play. And they're not just those kind of Donald Trump-like forces of sort of evil overlords. I think it's also in ourselves. We, we just go and we, we, we seek out things that we agree with. Uh, it, it seems to be who we are. Uh, and, and technology is making that possible. Can I just add two things to what Mark said? One, just on the librarian acquisition question. Remember, bibliometrics were not originally designed as a way to measure and evaluate research performance. They were designed as a tool for librarians to assist in the task of acquisitions. So they're, you know, that's where the whole uh, technique comes from. Um, the other thing, just to follow up on Mark's point, that it's not just the the, the dark side of um, of uh, of being drawn to the information you want. So I spent most of last year as the chief data scientist at the Conversation Media Group. Um, most people will be familiar with the conversation in this room. Um, but one of the things we did there was to overlay uh, postcodes on, I mean, block your ears if you're a bit um, sensitive about what people do with your private data. Um, <laughs> But anyway, um, what, one of the things we did was overlay postcodes on uh, people's IP addresses so that we could actually geographically locate the readership in Australia um, of the conversations, multiple millions of readers per month. Then we overlaid ABS socioeconomic indicators over the top of those postcodes. What we saw was that there was a direct uh, relationship between socioeconomic advantage and readers of the conversation. Um, the question, then arises is an editorial one. Is that the conversation delivering on its policy mission to spread information and to kind of generally raise uh, the awareness of issues amongst the community? Or is it in its own, I guess, echo chamber um, speaking to the people that would have accessed that information via other means anyway? Love it. Another reason why we need more librarians in the world. Didn't know it was going to be a librarian love fest. I love it. <laughs> Uh, we have time for one last question before we break for lunch. I think at the back, yes. Yep, um, Teresa, I'm a librarian. Um, so I come from the Victorian Government Library Service and we provide a library service at a shared service level to Victorian Government departments and selected agencies. So anyone here who needs our service, you can call me later. Um, my question is around the bibliometric side of things and I'm curious to know how realistic and sustainable is it and the reason I, there are two reasons. One, because I think it's inflated prices. And so we're finding we're having, we're getting slashed when it comes to access to quality research and information in peer reviewed journals. We're heavily reliant on the departments providing us the funding for subscriptions to these journals. But the cost is just, it's, it's painful. So we're cutting when it comes to access to these resources, unfortunately. Secondly, peer-reviewed content takes, God, how long can it take to be published? Um, and that could be whether it's part of an issue or article and press, but even to get to article and press, how long does that take? I rely heavily on APO because it gives me a lot of grey literature. It's giving me a lot of new content, new um, trends that I then push out to my clients. So I wonder how sustainable 
is bibliometrics because if it's going to result in libraries cutting back and reducing what they subscribe to, could that have a negative effect? Um, I'm sure Ginny will talk about this later on this afternoon, but um, one of the... I don't know what it is. It's not an irony. It's worse than an irony. Um, but part of the perversity of all of this is that the public invest into research via universities and other public institutions. That then gets either privatised and locked away effectively. Let's not call it privatised. It gets locked away behind a paywall uh, or in patents, copyright, various other forms of IP, which people have to pay to get access to again. Okay, forget, forget that for one second and let's assume that that's all okay and we accept the premise that underpins that, that you know, monopolies are good and that drives growth, etc. Let's suspend our disbelief for a second and say that's all good. The weird bit is then we develop these mechanisms to try and inject some accountability back into that original expenditure, which is where we develop all of these metrics. I suspect that if we hadn't locked this stuff away in the first place, the question of accounting for its value back to the taxpaying public or the politicians or whoever it might be would disappear. I mean, that question wouldn't exist in the first place. It wouldn't be an issue. We wouldn't have to have this discussion about, well, how do we account for the value we get back from our investment in public research? Because it would be obvious because it would be available. Um, so there's just some real perversities, I think, in that whole uh, logic of how the thing works. Doesn't answer your question. Sorry. Um, well, I, I think it will go away because it's like, um, I mean, one of the things they did recently was they, um, they, they stopped the funding for journal articles, you know, for academics. And, and, and now, you know, there's less emphasis on writing journal articles. You still write journal articles, but it's more about your track record for getting funding. So they're going to fiddle about with these metrics, and we're all just going to get more kind of like, oh, what the? Um, and, you know, there, there's a rise of alt metrics as well, which APO does too, you know, which is much more about impact and who's actually using them. And we'll get much more sophisticated about measuring alternative metrics, which will be much more about really what impact are they having. And down the line, we'll look at what impact are they having across socioeconomic groups. And we'll get more sophisticated and it will become, it will become less crazy and stupid and perverted <laughs> than it is at the moment. <laughs> Can, can, no, no, I'm going to agree with you, except for the, except for the last bit about it getting less stupid. Um, so, alternative metrics, yes, that will happen, um, but it's again a question of who owns them. So, if you look at uh, who currently is investing in those, it's the publishers. So, Alt Metrics, um, that whole digital science suite, is owned by the same company that owns Nature and Springer. So, you can see where this is heading. Yeah, I, 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 unfortunately, I, I, I sort of rem I'm a bit um, downbeat about this because I remember, I remember when the web first came out, when we got excited about it in 93, and I was talking to a librarian uh, at Glasgow University. He said, oh, great, this means you guys can start publishing your own journals. You know, you don't have to be slaves to these, these publishers. And, well, you know, that was 92, so that was a little while ago. Um, so I don't know. Um, um, I mean... There are there are definitely some some good good publishers out there. I, I edit a journal um, where the publisher really doesn't make very much money at all. They they they're happy for for the authors to put PDFs of the camera ready copy up on websites and so on. Um, and a lot of publishers are like that. But they but the big publishers um, certainly are finding that. Um, I mean, it's certainly in my area, in, in computer science, almost every paper is actually sitting on a website somewhere. You just, and, you, and actually Google Scholar finds you those links almost always. But it's interesting how a lot of people don't actually realize that the, the link off to the right-hand side on Google Scholar is actually the free copy. And, and, and there's clearly a lot of people still go click on that main link uh, on the left and, and still go to the publisher and then still demand that their university gets that subscription. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I don't really know what the, what the necessary solution to this is. You certainly see archive in science 
taking off, and archive is certainly being used a lot um, uh, for, for science and computer science research, and a lot of people are publishing in there, but they do typically then get the, 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 the final version put into some, uh, some uh, um, um, forum that's run by, uh, by a publisher. Um, so I, I don't know, there's, there's, there's a lot of inertia, uh, a huge amount of inertia in, in making these changes. Um, and I, I find myself wondering, what it is, what, what's going on. Is it just inertia or is there actually some reason? It, you know, is it handy that when you become the editor of a journal that they give you some money to get a PA to help you manage things? And you know, maybe there just has to be a little bit, bit of money to run these things. Um, uh, you know, maybe it's just too hard to run it for free. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't fully understand why this hasn't sort of fallen away, um, you know, because the, the ability to do it has been around since the since the early 90s um, uh, if, if it was that easy so so I don't know there must be some reason as to why we we need publishers to have these various systems to help us sort of manage things I'll add final word to that you know I think it's a really complex ecosystem that we have and again my worry is as we go down the impact engagement line this is going to get more and more complicated so as much as alt metrics yes but it's really about engagement and outreach it doesn't actually measure impact and yet our politicians lots of people think oh yeah but it's got a metric attached you know and and what we really are trying to measure is the quality of things how has research changed someone's life that is not something typically that surface metrics are going to be able to answer and at the same time unis rely on these heavily for promotion and tenure and until we fix that piece because um, lots of librarians talk about open access that's the solution we just get people to stop publishing over there we'll get them published over there and what we've seen is actually just an offloading of the costs onto authors so right now I spend a lot of my time counseling postdocs on why they don't have any money to publish in the top journal, but they need that to build their track record. And so in a way, for some people, the system is worse under open access. That's a good debate we can have this afternoon. Meanwhile, we're standing between you and lunch, so please thank my uh, speakers again.